Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Much better. Welcome to Mount Mitchell as we gather to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Are there any announcements? Wednesday night, will we? Well, I can't even talk. We will resume Bible study. However, I will ask that you use social distance and will strongly urge you to wear a mask if you feel the need and also to sanitize your hands as you enter and leave. I'm just doing this to protect all of us and keep us all safe. Also, immediately after service, right up front here, where you see all these school supplies that we gather, and I just want to thank you for that. Thank you for the all this, and all the children that get them will, will appreciate it. Thank you for that. But the PPR will be gathering here right after service briefly and to speak with Nancy, and she will fill you in then. Any other announcements? Let us please stand as the light of Christ enters our midst. Maybe see
Are there any joys or prayer concerns this morning? Congratulations. That is a joy. Any others? I'd like to lift up the family of uh, Pastor David Rayford and yes. his wife Jeannie in the loss of, of her mother. Yes. And, uh, uh, also, uh, when I was at Beth Page Presbyterian, the man who took care of the sound. His name was Phil Allen. He lived right up the street from me also. He's a neighbor. And he passed away this week. And um, I would like to remember his family. Just remember the Rayford and the Allen family. As they mourn losses of loved ones. Any others? COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Joy, the new playground equipment out there. Yes. That looks really nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Jim, if we can keep you all followed, I have a good time. <laughs> Any others? It's okay. Why don't Are there any others? Yes, sir. Pray for that grandson as his wrist heals. Five years old. Five years old. Any others? Continue prayers for Steve after the death of his wife. Um, uh, educator, John Hoffman, found out yesterday he passed away unexpectedly. And for his family and the family of Dr. Martha West, she was uh, director of education earlier in my career. Lord knows who it is. Any other sister? A friend with back surgery who is recuperating. Patty. Justin with pancreatic cancer. Any others? If you have an unspoken request, let it be known by the sign of surrender. Lord, it's been another tough week, but I know you've been with me. And Lord, knowing this, I know that I can truly surrender all. I'm going to do things a little differently. I'm going to come down here with all our school supplies, and I'm going to bless them while we pray. Let us now look to the Lord. Father God, we thank you 
for this gift at the altar, for these gifts. And those that gave these so that children can use them to learn. Anoint them, Father. So that the children who receive them will be anointed to learn. Will be like sponges and absorb all the knowledge that they can. Thank you, Father, for those who gave. And those who wanted to give but could not. Bless them doubly, Father. Now, Father, knowing that you're the loving God that you are, our Heavenly Father. Lord, we know that when we are in the midst of trials and tribulation, when we are in the midst of sickness, when we are in the midst of a resurgent pandemic, we know that you are in the midst. And we ask, dear Lord, that you continue to be with us, that you comfort us in, in times of loss. That you touch and heal in times of sickness. And that you give us the wisdom to do the things that will keep us safe and healthy. Be with us, Father. Strengthen us. Guide us. And protect us. Give us the desire to serve you each and every day. To let the world see in our deeds, our faith. Father, we just thank you. And we leave all these petitions, whether spoken or unspoken, in your holy hands. And we claim them done by praying in the manner in which your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join with me as we reaffirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed, located on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. standing as we receive our tithes and offerings. Those that gave, and Lord, for those who were unable to give, 
I ask the double blessing upon them. Father, I ask that this offering be used for the spreading of the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, throughout our community, throughout our country, and throughout our world. And let the church say, ever asked the question, is my faith real? Well, I did after I first gave my life to the Lord. I would want, is it real? Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Ways to, to know that your faith is real. Becoming from James chapter 2 verses 14 to 26. James 2 14 to 26. And the scripture will be familiar. James chapter 2, 14 to 26. And I will give our folks who may be watching from home a little, uh, maybe an extra minute to find James 2, verses 14 to 26. Is my faith real? As you are able, let us please stand as we read. 
James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. And I will be reading from the King James Version. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, ye give them not thing, those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yes, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou believest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou, have, seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works has faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imparted unto him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Mirages. Everyone knows what a mirage is, right? Walking out in the desert. You see an oasis suddenly, some water out in the middle of the desert. But it's possibly a mirage. And these mirages don't only occur in the mind of a, of a thirsty wanderer. Now the scientific reason behind a mirage is that it's a dense layer of hot air rising from the ground or a hot surface reflecting possibly the images around them. Now we've seen these, have we not? Even around here on those hot summer days driving down a hot asphalt road and you look in the distance and you see that heat coming up and it looks like water in the road, does it not? But it's not. And, there, but, and there's also another problem with the mirage. It disappears when you come close to examine it. It's only a reflection it's not the genuine article. There's no fountain of gushing cool water to, for the, the thirsty wanderer in the desert. There's only more heat, more frustration, and more despair. Just like mirages offer empty hope to a desperate traveler. Folks, do you realize that there's a faith? And I'm going to call it a mirage faith that never delivers. And the deception of a mirage faith is perhaps the saddest story of all. It's so close to the real thing. Yet it's as far as forever from the real Genuine satisfaction. There are many people in the United States that say that they are Christians. In a survey, a random fact, they ask Americans, adults, if they were Christian. And 55% of the adults in the country said they were Christians. 
But I believe, and this is my opinion, that a lot of these have a mirage faith. If 55% of the American adults were Christians, our country would be a better place to live. How many have ever been to Disney World or Disneyland? How many of you went through the Hall of Presidents? You saw those animatronic, those uh, robot presidents. <laughs> I had a brain dig up there for a second. Animatronic. There's the word I'm trying to say. They stood there and they looked real. They even moved like humans. They talked. They stood up. They gestured. Why, even you, there was Lincoln and Washington and all the others were there. It's, it was amazing to see. It's lifelike engineering accomplished by computers and motors. They look quite real, but they're not. It's only the appearance of life on the outside. They look and act real, but on the inside, they're quite dead. Only imitations of the real thing. What's the difference between a mirage faith and real faith? I'm glad you asked that. How can we tell if our faith is genuine? James gives us a great measuring stick. Firstly, we find out that genuine faith reveals itself in deeds of love. I'm going to repeat that. Genuine faith reveals itself in deeds of love. Now, there are many... Great translations of verse number 14. Here's mine. What is the use of declaring your faith to the world if your actions don't correspond? Is that the kind of faith that saves? James contends that true Christianity is seen in the person that is willing to be involved in the things of Christ on Christ's terms. But on the other hand, a mirage faith only becomes involved when it's comfortable when, or when it's convenient. A real estate agent may declare that the first three principles of selling real estate is location, location, location. Yes, in that order. For a genuine faith, the first three principles are involvement, involvement, involvement. Again, in that order. Involvement with Christ daily. Involvement with God's people daily. Involvement with His Word daily, sharing His love. Involvement with his world. Folks, we're converted to Christ-likeness according to, to verses 15 and 16. Jesus spent his life serving, giving, and telling. On a desert hillside, Jesus fed thousands with a few sardines and, and some bread. That was no mirage. It was an act of genuine faith. He wrapped a towel around his waist and washed 12 sets of filthy feet. That was no mirage. It was an act of faith in the principles of servanthood. On a hill outside Jerusalem, he died an agonizing death. It was more than just being an example. 
he became the gospel. Living it out in faith, defining the meaning of love. It was the ultimate expression of receiving the Father's word and submitting to his will. Indeed, genuine faith reveals itself in deeds of love. What could it possibly mean to, to accept Christ if not to accept his lordship over your life and to accept his choosing of your life's work? Genuine faith reveals itself in deeds of love. The second thing you can find, eternal life in the kind of faith that reveals itself in loving deeds. And verse 26 is the key to this principle. James uses the negative to il illustrate the positive. He tells us a very simple but accurate fact. The body without spirit is dead. So is our faith without works. The fact teaches the opposite. When the body has a spirit, it's alive. When our faith is not a mirage, but has love and deeds sprouting out of that faith. The faith is alive and pulsating. It's like the budding limbs on a young tree. The sprouts don't cause the tree to be alive. They simply announce the fact that the tree is alive. I once heard a story of a pastor who had a friend in Florida and they owned an orange grove. And during the freeze of 83, this friend said that the only trees that would survive would be the trees that are producing fruit. The others would have to be destroyed. But what tree will be alive and never put forth leaves or fruit? If the tree is truly alive, it must put forth leaves and put forth fruit. But yet there are many folks today who are content to, to never be involved in putting their faith to the test. Simply saying that you're a Christian and associating yourself with a church does not mean you have genuine faith. I'm sure all of you have heard the parable that Jesus told about the sowing of seed. Some fell and grew and took hold in good soil. But there were some, actually many, that only sent down a shallow root. And when the, the shoot came up, it quickly withered and died. And we see this played out over and over and over again in our churches across our country. A person makes a profession of faith but a lot of times it's only a mirage. They never bothered to set down good roots, good deep roots. They never bothered to, to join Bible study. They never bothered to, to come to Sunday school. They never bothered to come regularly to worship. They starve that little seed to death. And their faith quite possibly becomes another statistic of what we call the backdoor syndrome. Does everyone know what backdoor syndrome is? Well, let me tell you what the backdoor syndrome is. That's where half of your church doesn't come. They sneak out the back door. We let them escape out the back door. Never to be heard from. Again. But folks, it, it takes a mature tree to bring forth worthwhile fruit. 
We can't expect a little seedling to bear crops. But seedlings won't grow. Seedlings that won't grow are not worth the effort to water, feed, and weed. And the point is not vague here that James is trying to make. James is saying unless we are willing to grow in Christ, allowing the faith to become works, then we have a mirage faith. Our faith is empty. Our faith is dead without hope. Some may be longtime church members or never joined the church. And I'm going to be quite honest. Huh? Church membership's not the question here. There have been people who, who were po profess to be members of the church and don't come to worship and don't come for many years and some might even say, well, just do as much good as you can for all the people that you can. And you'll have a good understanding with the Master. Sounds like pious words from a, a church member. But I think it's a smoke screen. A smoke screen for the reality of wanting to free themselves up for the bass and deer on Sundays. Hunters and fishers, go ahead and say oh me. Folks, there's a balance between faith and works. And this balance will make a true believer want to be close to his Lord in worship. We want them to be close or want to be close to God on Wednesdays at Bible study. We want to be close to God at Sunday school. We want to do as much as they can for God each and every day. Make them want to dig in His Word each and every day. But a mirage faith will cause you to leave your Bible in your, on the dash of your car or on the coffee table or in your bedroom just to be picked up again to come to church. Amen or oh me. Preacher, you've stopped preaching and gone to meddling. Now the rituals that we all went through to join a church identified us with that local church. Identified us with that body of people. And folks, that's good. I strongly recommend it. As a matter of fact, if you're here and you're not a member of the church, please, and you want to become a member, please come see me. And we will make you a member. Be more than glad to. But it's the deeds of love, born of an alive faith, that identifies you with Christ Jesus. It tells others that He's alive within you. Like we Methodists love to say, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. So pastor, how can I have a genuine faith and not a mirage faith? How can I be sure Look at the examples that James gives us in, in verse 21. He says, Abraham was justified on the basis of, of his faithfulness. God asked Abraham to burn the bridges behind him and leave his home and follow God out in the wilderness. Told him to say goodbye to all the family, all the friends, and leave everything behind. And never look back. And Abraham said, let's go. I'm ready. That was faith. But I'm going to go a little deeper and say that, that it was the loading of the camels, the, the end, never ending ridicule I imagine that he, him and Sarah went through. That was the works. I can almost picture the scene. That nosy neighbor. Abraham. You know there's snakes in the desert. I've known people go out there and never come back. They didn't have a map. They got lost and the snakes got them. Mm. 
Maybe, Abraham, you, you might need to rethink this. It ain't too smart going out there in the desert. But what did Abraham do? He went. He listened to God. And he went. The story of Rahab the harlot burned her bridges behind her. When the children of Israel were marching her way, she made the decision to throw in with God's people. And she helped the spies of Joshua get out. Now, again, let's picture the scene inside the walls of Jericho. Rahab, are you nuts? Here we are inside the most fortified city in Canaan. Those silly Jews don't know how to fight. All they're doing is walking around the place. You better reconsider the city fathers aren't going to like it when they hear you've been helping these folks. But Rahab hung in there. And those silly Jews, they kept marching seven days around the walls of Jericho. And then seven times on the seventh day, and the walls came tumbling down. The faith of Rahab, a harlot, is also... Chronicled in her ge genealogy in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. How many knew this? Rahab's grandson was named Jesse, who had a son named David. King David, to be exact. And out of the lineage of David was born a king in a manger, Christ Jesus. Rahab had faith. She put it all on the line in her deeds, in her actions. How can we know for sure that our faith is alive? Throw yourself wholeheartedly into deeds of loving service to others. I guarantee within a month you will know if you have a genuine faith. You will know what's genuine and you will know what is a mirage. Well, where do you start? Begin with forgiving your neighbors and fellow church members. Start to give of yourself instead of concentrating on your needs. Well, but isn't that the model that Christ gave us? Depend on the Father to supply what needs to be given. Don't concentrate on what you don't have to give. But most of all, start. Near the end of the Civil War, a northern general wrote to Lincoln, I believe if the battle is pressed now, we will have the surrender of Lee within a month. The general had received orders to back, back off, and, and he was voicing his opinion for going full steam ahead. Lincoln simply wrote back, Then let the thing be pressed. It was the final turning point in the war. How can we know for certain that, that our faith is genuine and not a mirage? Let the thing be pressed. Press forward, full steam ahead. Get yourself involved in loving service to others. Join in. Get busy. A true conversion in faith will take over your life, your family, and you'll never feel so alive. The story is told about a woman who came to her pastor at the end of the service. She told him that she would give anything to be involved in this great service to Jesus Christ. The pastor asked her, 
Can you give five loaves and two fishes? And she says, well, I don't have very much at all. I, I don't have that. And the pastor responds, do you have anything special that you can give? No. Not really, the lady responded. The pastor says, can you sing? Her voice lifted. She said, yes, I, I can sing a little. I sing at home. I once sang in, in my school's talent contest. And the pastor said to her, Then you will give your voice to the Lord. And he had her sing that very night. After the evening service, a man responded to the invitation. And he gave his heart to Christ. And he shared with the pastor that it was the gospel presented in song that had won his heart. Are you alive? Or does it, does it seem like a dead, dead end with only struggle in sight? Do you find no joy other than gratifying your desires and collecting the toys and trophies of this world? Do you ever question the strength of your commitment to Christ? Occasionally, a person will get involved in the church and there's no change. There's no joyful satisfaction in being involved in the things of God. The problem there was the cart before the horse. You cannot work yourself into a living faith. You cannot work yourself into having a genuine faith. The problem again was the heart of the cart before the horse. I invite you all today, where you're sitting, if you need to make a deeper commitment to Christ, if you need to make a deeper commitment to the work of God, I invite you to do that today. Here at Mount Mitchell, we offer an opportunity to, to press the thing. To make an outward sign of that inward grace. And that's where the work begins. And folks, I can guarantee when you make that commitment, I can guarantee on the promise of God's word that if your faith is genuine in making this commitment, it will not be a mirage. It will lead us to a, a closer and deeper relationship with God, a close and deeper relationship with each other. And we will be found pleasing in the eyes of God. And let the church say, Please stand as you are able and join with me in singing hymn number 367. 367. <laughs>
shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant equip you with everything good that you may that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom be glory forever and ever and let the church say God bless you and our prayers are with you.